Jeremiah chapter 10. Uh, if you found it, then uh, hold it and go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. It might help us to be reminded of a little context. So why is there so much attention given to Israel, this being Judah, uh, that portion of Israel as, after they divided? But, uh, and also uh, look at First Peter chapter 2. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 10, uh, why is the Lord giving attention to Israel? Well, because they were chosen. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people who are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. That's uh, pretty significant, isn't it? And uh, that truth would uh, bear uh, receiving in the new covenant as well. No room for pride. Room for a lot of amazement. So he chose them, redeemed them, and uh, in verse 9, he is the Lord God who keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face. Now, you say, okay, well, I'm not Judah. I don't know what my background is, but I don't think I'm Jewish or or whatever. But in First Peter, it comes after the epistle to James, First Peter chapter two, verse nine through twelve, writing to a New Testament congregation, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's a good King James word. Now, when we think of people who are peculiar, we think they're strange. You're a peculiar person. Well, it's a word that, that means us. God set your set His heart on you. He's He set you aside for Himself. He, he's you're particular to Him. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now hath obtained mercies. And he goes on to talk about we are strangers and pilgrims, and we, to, we need to refrain from the lust of the flesh. So in Jer Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, uh, these people whom God has chosen, he's saying, look, do not learn the way of the heathen, or the, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Uh, do not be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the Gentiles are dismayed by them. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. So, in chapter 9... God had lamented through Jeremiah that the people of Israel, his chosen people, were acting just like the uncircumcised Gentiles. And uh, in chapter 10, so he's saying, separate yourself from the ways and the gods and the idols 
of the Gentiles. Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Uh, one translation says, do not be disciples of the religion of the nations. Do not learn the ways of the Gentiles. There's a verse, and I should have looked it up, uh, be, be ignorant concerning the heathen and be wise concerning that which is good. You've seen that somewhere, right? Uh, that's close. Uh, so, uh, so let's just pause there for a moment. Why do I need to be concerned about that? Well, do we not also live in a world that 24-7 is trying to indoctrinate us to their ways? We may have more intense of that than, than anybody because of media, 24-7. We're being indoctrinated and, and people are trying to persuade us to turn aside from the Word of God, even many who are in the churches, to turn aside from the Bible, to embrace evolution, to embrace confusion of the sexes, uh, to accept abortion, to sell your soul out to materialism, to be content with a sort of a moralism, but not anything of Christianity where uh, morals are an overflow out of your knowledge and walk with God. Anything and everything but Jesus only. Anything and everything but this word only. So, uh, this is an old battle. So, again, we are seeing that setting Jeremiah is important for us. We're not looking for a history lesson uh, to know all the details of how it all played out in their lives, but seeing that here we are thousands of years later and we're having similar battles. So, dealing with idols. What is an idol? Anything that takes the place of God? Any other thoughts? What is the appeal of the idol? Look at verse 9 in chapter 10. Well, at verse 8 and 9. But they are altogether brutish and foolish the stock is a doctrine of vanities. A silver spread into plates is brought from Tarsus and gold from Euphes in the work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder, the blue and purple and the coaling. They're all the work of cunning men. So as something is coming through the eye gate, there's an appeal through the eye gate. And so many idols the temptation comes through the eye gate. First Timothy, I mean, First John, chapter two, verse twelve through seventeen. Uh, pretty familiar to us. First John, chapter two, verse fifteen through seventeen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from God. So, oh, go all the way back to Genesis 3. The temptation is set before Eve, and oh, it's, it's pleasant to the eyes. The eyes are a wonderful gift from God. You and I take it for granted. We've always had, you might have glasses or had eye surgery, but every one of us saw well enough to drive here today. Uh, we've enjoyed sunsets and sunrises and all different things and the birds and different things all week long. Uh, I had no concept of the world of a girl that I was in class with in high school. Uh, I, had a, my, I had a class, uh, we had a, a Latin class. You say, you took Latin? Yes. And she was blind. And she did everything from Braille. I mean, she was not partially blind, she was totally blind. We were nice to her, but 
we had no concept. We were focused on ourselves. In fact, what a shame to misuse such a gift. And invariably, sin is a misuse of a good gift from God. Idols very, very often are a misuse of a good gift from God. A child can be an idol. Your home, your vehicle, whatever. I mean, we, it's uh, another thing that is uh, tempting about idolatry is that we are uncomfortable if we're not with the crowd. Whatever the crowd is doing, we tend to go that way. So in verse 2, he says, do not be dismayed at the signs of the heaven. And the, the pagans were dismayed. And this could be a reference to not merely the sun, the moon, the stars, but to eclipses and comets and meteors, and which they would take to be, oh, something bad is coming. And, you know, people still do that today. So... But in verse 3, he says, For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, they decorate it with silver and gold, they fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not tumble, topple. So uh, he describes the custom of cutting a tree, setting it in place, decorating it, worshiping it. And so Israel got a lot of this from the pagan world, and they just adapted it. Uh, so we look around at what the world is doing. Spurgeon said many years ago that London got her dress styles from Paris, and Paris got them from hell. He was talking about the sensuous dress styles that even was, were worn by women in his day. And so, again, uh, all morality, all of what, what God wants goes out the window because we're just going with the crowd. So there is a strong emphasis all through the Bible warning us to flee from idolatry. I mean, there's, we, can, we can be idolatrous about almost anything under the sun. Idolatry is defined by Webster's Dictionary as excessive devotion or reverence for some person or thing. As was indicated earlier, it is something or someone that takes the primary place of God. Some of you have heard me Tell, and I happened to find it this morning. I had a little track from many years ago. It's entitled, It Was His Life. It Was His Whole Life. And so you open it up, and it says, A few months ago, a San Francisco newspaper reported a strange scene at the cemetery in that city. A young man killed in a motorcycle accident was buried that in itself is not so uncommon, but the fact that the motorcycle he was riding when he was killed was buried with him was highly unusual. His mother, sobbing, looking into that gravesite with her, the body of her son and the motorcycle, she explained it was his whole life. So what would I be buried with? What would you and I be buried with that would be a genuine token of what was our life? One of the things about, the, a word that we need to deal with in thinking about who or what we worship is the word enthusiasm or enthusiastic. The word enthusiasm comes from en, E-N, equals I-N, and theos, which is God. So enthusiasm literally means 
the God in you. The tragedy of our day is that so many people are captivated by gods that are not real gods. These are the gods of men. But there is a true God, the living God, and he is all-powerful. And you could not bury him in a grave. He is spirit. He's eternal. He is in heaven. Uh, idols can be forbidden icons. You should not, uh, Exodus 20, you should not make it to yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in earth beneath or in the waters below. Uh, we're not to make a graven image of, of Christ or of God. We should not bow down to them, worship them. Uh, I read about a thing that happened in 2007 at the Emmy Awards. You may have heard of or seen the very funny pagan comedian named Kathy Griffin. She's a funny person. It's been a long time since I saw something she did. But she's uh, a good she, thing. Huh? It's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. She's gotten more vile than ever. Oh, yeah, she's, she is. So here's what happened at the Emmy Awards. She came forward to accept her award, and she said something along these lines. A lot of people come up here and thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that there is no one who had less to do with this award than Jesus. He didn't help me one bit. So, I can, so all I can say is, forget you, Jesus, except the words that she really said there you couldn't print. This award is my God now. So an idol has been defined as anything or anyone that we love more than the Lord, trust in more than the Lord, give more attention to than the Lord. Idolatry gives the worship, the honor, the attention which God deserves. The world is full of idolaters, both in and outside the church. But um, judgment day is coming. So again, uh, when you think of something that someone comes to you with serious meaning, you know they're not joking, and they say, flee! And you know what they're saying flee from? You do it. Why? Because you realize there's great danger. The building is on fire. Flee! Run! You know what the Bible says about idolatry? Flee. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, Therefore, my beloved... Flee from idolatry. Now, there's a word that the Word of God often puts with that, and that is the word covetousness. Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. So we're, we're not preaching now, we're meddling. We're getting down to where we live on a daily basis. And we have to come to grips that this is not just something that brought great destruction in Israel, but it has brought great destruction through the years, through the centuries, to lots of people. It's not just a, a horrendous disease of the pagans, but it is very susceptible, uh, the, the Christian is very susceptible to being, uh, to embracing this and to having their testimony uh, destroyed. Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so we understand this. If you, you go to the doctor and uh, 
he says, you've got gangrene crawling up your leg. It's on the inside. You knew that your leg was swollen. You knew this was a problem, but you didn't know it was gangrene. And so uh, maybe the appropriate term is not kill it, but you, but you want it gone. And uh, in 1 John 5, 21, from the living paraphrase, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. This is strongly emphasized over and over in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 5, 11, But now I have written you not to keep company with anyone who is named a brother, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortion, not even to eat with such a person. This in the context of church, church discipline. Why? Because it's contagious. You're susceptible. Now, lifestyle idolatry is a sign of not being a Christian based on the, uh, the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. Don't you know that unrighteousness, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. Uh, being an idolater doesn't sound as bad as being a fornicator or an adulterer or a homosexual or a sodomite. But it's in the same list. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Good old King James word. Use it all the time, right? It means, in essence, to be turned on sexually outside the will of God. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revel, uh, those who revile, <laughs> revilers, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I've told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I believe that was from the, uh, must have been from the Amplified. So idolaters are listed right along with all the other stuff, and and. And uh, by the way, um, attitude, no problems, anger, dissensions, envy. So you say, you keep quoting all these verses and saying the same thing. Well, the Holy Spirit put all of these verses in the Bible. And he keeps repeating himself. God does not have dementia. He has not forgotten what he's just said. In his mercy toward us, he keeps hammering away at the thing which is so destructive and that we're so prone to, that's eh, not a problem. I can handle it. Israel had a problem, but I don't have a problem. Well, judgment is coming. For who? Revelation 21.8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving... The abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. 22.15, outside of dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. It's easier than we think to be guilty of idolatry. You heard me say before that in, in India, uh, it is said that they have 330 million gods, and we have that many and more. The land is full of idols. 
John, 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What is the nature of true conversion? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. You, he's, he's recording the testimony of the, when, when the Thessalonican church was birthed and when these people got saved, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's, that's the reality of conversion. It's not just walking down an aisle and, yeah, I'm saved. And walk out and continue to walk like you've always walked. Uh, again, 1 John 5, 19 through 21. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Again, 1 Corinthians 10. Do not be idolaters. Flee from idolatry. The world offers us a million things to to get interested in, to get enthusiastic about, to let it creep in and to take priority in our soul and to begin to live for that and to have our commitment to Christ diluted or pulled away from it. So what is the chief weapon in winning the battle over idolatry? Foundation, of course, is being saved. But then what? Flee. Run. Uh, I, bet, I bet many of you can still picture the, the towers, 9-11. What do we see? Scenes of people fleeing. Now, yes, there were some lingering because they were trying to help save some people. But they were, they were not any, they, they did not understand the, the depth of what they were dealing with. But uh, they were not just lingering, oh, let's go ha have a cup of coffee. They, were, they recognized the danger and they were trying to help others. Uh, another another uh, uh, teaching that we'll find in uh, the book of Acts is sometimes the thing we have to do is to destroy. Uh, they, the, some of the new Christians, they had some books and things, and they turned their back on them and they destroyed them. Uh, I remember uh, a young man, when we had this Christian school, had a very fine collection of pretty seriously hard rock music albums, tapes, and whatever was the vogue at that time. Worth a lot of money. And people assured him that they're worth a lot of money, but he destroyed them. And I don't know if he ever had second thoughts about that or not, but at that moment in time, uh, that was a good thing. Now, the Ephesians 4 talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new man. That's a, that's a dynamic in winning spiritual battles. And if you're being overwhelmed with something, some tradition or some person or whatever, in, in, in ways and you know it's cooling your commitment to Christ, uh, there's a concept of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. But there is a powerful concept in Galatians 5.16 that has many applications for us. He says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The most powerful way to win over any old habit or any old tradition or any old sin or whatever is to cultivate a new love. If you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit living within you, Walk in the Spirit. Make that our focus. So cultivate love for Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm sure that in the epistles, the first thing in Romans, the first thing in Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, especially those, the first thing is to talk about 
what Christ has done, who we are in Christ, the wonders of who God is, then, in Ephesians, in chapter 4, therefore, then start, here's how you walk. And so, in winning spiritual battles, and winning victory over whatever, and having, and getting, making sure that you have the right perspective. And we have people and things and stuff vying for our hearts. It's the first thing that Satan did was to set something before Adam and Eve that was a temptation to go outside or beyond God's provision and to be enamored with it. All right. I knew we would not get through many verses today because I felt like we really needed to spend some time focusing on a tremendous focus in the Bible on idolatry, idols, covetousness, and, and to see uh, how we win spiritual battles. Father, help us to uh, come to grips with these incredible, almost, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but in our flesh we say these are just monotonous warnings. And Lord, they're not monotonous. They're, they're pleas from the one who loves. Warnings. We're hard of hearing on this. We need repetition on this. We need to embrace the call to flee from idolatry, to put off the old man, to put on the new man, to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, to bring the things that we do and the choices we make before the judgment of God's word and does it square with what God is calling us to do. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.